Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the series of lectures on mycology, virology, and parasitology. I am Dr. Navneet, and I will be taking uh, these lectures and doing your review questions on these series on the app. Um, today, we'll be starting with the maiden lecture on uh, pathogenesis and uh, principles of treatment on mycology. This is an important uh, 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 starting point because you need to know what is the basic terminology regarding fungi and the certain clinching features in diagnosis and treatment of uh, fungal disorders. Uh, please do refer to the WhatsApp group discussions and review questions at the end of each lecture to enhance your learning. So I will uh, start with uh, the introduction to what fungi are. Fungi are basically multicellular organisms which are uh, uh, eukaryotic and one important thing about fungi is the difference in the cell membrane and cell wall pertaining to medical usage. That is because our drugs are targeting the cell wall and the fungus rather than anything else. In contrast to uh, bacteria, we have very few drugs or almost no drugs that are targeting the protein machinery or ribosomal targets like how we do it in bacteriology. So fungal drugs are very limited in number and nowadays we are having a lot of emerging resistant fungi like Lomentospora and Schidosporium which are completely resistant to all the known standard antifungals. Fungal uh, disorders are either uh, endemic or they are opportunistic. If they are endemic, usually they are never of the common normal microbiota of the body. Organisms like Aspergillus and Candida are usually a part of the normal microbiota. So usually in patients with immunosuppression, these endomicrobiome will come, become a different morphology. For example, it will the Candida from the blastospore will become a pseudohyphal form causing invasion and problems. So the normal endomicrobiome will be the problem in opportunistic fungal infections, whereas that's not the case in endemic. At the same time, there's another classification, which is basically mucocutaneous and deep organ. Mucocutaneous are present only on the mucus and the skin like dermatophytosis, etc. or vaginal candidiasis, whereas deep seated infections are the ones that usually are associated with bloodstream infections or they can have an individual organ system destruction like for example histoplasmosis or for example candidemia or aspergillosis etc. So let's start with a review question. We'll come back to this question at the end of the lecture to see if we are able to answer this with ease. So a 32 year old lady with a white curdy vaginal discharge and mild pruritus is presenting to the OBGYN. On ID consult you find the KOH mount and culture showing yeast with pseudohyphae. No other foci is found. Which of the following is a unique risk factor for the aforementioned? So you look at the options, it's cancer chemotherapy with poor performance status, diabetes and uncontrolled glycemic status, recent antibiotic use and post transplant immunosuppression. So look at the question, come to a diagnosis or a, amount, a series of ideas and then look at the options. Don't try to rule out the options upfront that leads to more error than correctness. So if you look at the question, it usually I think is referring to mucosal candidiasis or a candida infection, which is a clinching word is white cardi discharge. So when you look at such a question, you come to a diagnosis of mucosal or a vaginal candidiasis because no other foci is found. They are asking you which is the most unique risk factor for the aforementioned. Everything looks like an important risk factor here. But when we go at the end of this lecture, we'll come to know why and what is the correct answer. Fungi are classified mainly on the basis of their morphology. Okay, we don't have a genetic classification into medical microbiology as such. So we divide the fungi into mold and yeast. Firstly, let's start with yeast. Yeast basically are three important uh, organisms. First one is Candida. Okay, it can be Candida glabrata, auris, or Candida albicans. The second one is Cryptococcus. The third one is a very close differential, trichosporon. Trichosporonosis is an important mimicker of disseminated candidiasis. I'm telling it to you right away. I'm telling you those fungi which don't appear to uh, a common doctor at first glance. They appear to be like candida, they appear to be like aspergillus, but they are not. I will stress upon those fungi which are behaving abnormally. One of them is trichosporonosis. Trichosporonosis mimics hepatosplenic candidiasis. That is a very important fact uh, point. So yeast which are candida, cryptococcus and trichosporum can appear in two forms. 
one there's a single cell organism with a small butt this butt is called a blastospore okay this blastospore or blastoconidium will bifurcate and they asexually differentiate and form another organism okay these are inhaled or they're inoculated or they're present in the normal microbiota of the body these are called as true buds when you have a series of buds on the single cell they appear like a small long chain mycelium hence that is called a hyphae but it's actually not a hyphae so they called it pseudo hyphae so this is a pseudo hyphae if they form a chain like that with connections so this pseudo hyphae can be present in canada normal hyphae also can be present in canada pseudo hyphae is a very specific thing for canada in our level at this point so you have yeast which are of three types candida cryptococcus and trichospora now the ones in, like candida albicans can switch between pseudo hyphae and yeast okay they can switch okay they can form a germ cell tube germ tube and they can switch between one and two but there are candida which are exclusively yeast these are candida oris and glabrata okay again they are abnormally behaving because they are resistant to everything why they are resistant i will tell you but remember that candida oris and candida glabrata present as exclusive yeast forms including cryptococcus they are exclusively yeast whereas candida can appear to become a hyphelial pseudo hyphelial form on the other hand you have molds these are a very large group and a diverse group of fungi okay now bear with me that molds can be differentiated into septate and aseptate molds are basically having elements of serially arranged mycelium this is called as a mycelium these motifs which are present can be spores itself okay these can individually be spores so these are all septated so each one has one nuclei okay so they are septated on the other hand, you have aseptate. Basically, they are called xenocytic or they have multiple nuclei like this and they don't have a septa. There's aseptate. These are basically your mucorails. So look at the mucorails, the family mucoraceae, rhizopus, 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 rhizomucor, okay, mucor and actinomucor. Then you have lichthemia, cunninghamella, cocheromyces, marshella, saxenia, apoph apoph apophysomyces, and syncephalostrum. These are mucorails. Okay, they are basically mucor, zygomyces, and rhizomucor. These basically are aseptate fungi. Okay, now you have septate fungi. Septate molds are the ones that are either hyaline or dermatitious. If any septate has a melanin component in it, then we call it dermatitious. These, these are melanin positive. Okay, how will you detect melanin? You use a stain called as Fontana Mason stain. Fontana mason stain which is going to detect the melanin and those fungi are called as dermatitious fungi on the other hand you have hyaline fungi which are basically hyaline you remember hyaline from nephrology casts they're basically very clear and they can be seen through so basically hyaline are melanin negative and hence they're called hyaline and most important you need to know is aspergillus penicillium etc okay so just remember these then in a septate, you have another classification, which is basically dimorphic fungi. Okay, so dimorphic fungi are fungi which can be present at, as two different morphologies at two different temperatures. In the body, inciting a host response at 37 degrees Celsius, they appear as yeast. But outside in the atmosphere, as inhalational forms, they appear as mycelium. That is very important for one to know that they can be present in two different forms at two different temperatures. That is called as dimorphic fungi. And one important thing about dimorphic fungi is most of them are endemic also, but they're not the same. Lot of endemic fungi present in the America, Africa are usually dimorphic, but you have dimorphic fungi elsewhere and which are not endemic also. Okay, so you have yeast on one hand and you have mold on one hand. So yeast is candida, cryptococcus and trichosporonosis. And then you have mold which are septate and aseptate. Septate can be divided into dimorphic, hyaline and dermatitious. And Fontana mason stain is going to stain the melanin which is going to be dermatitious fungi. Dermatitious fungi are basically those fungi which are going to have uh, melanin, correct? So these dermatitious fungi, why it's important for us to know that because usually it causes subcutaneous tissue infection or it can cause a brain abscess. 
and hence these dermatitious fungi are two types which is pheohyphomycosis and chromoblastomycosis and dermatitious fungi requires more than two antifungals to be given it usually requires more multiple antifungals to be given for its effect to be significant okay these are dermatitious fungi now coming to the spores now listen fungus has spores that's how they disseminate and cause infection most of the time the spores are either inoculated or ingested or most commonly inhaled now what are the two important spores that we need to know see the spores of fungi can be either conidia okay they can be either sporangiospore okay or first i will describe these two so conidia is basically when you have a columella okay and you have a series of phyllites okay series of phyllites and on top of these phyllites you have buds like this on top of these phyllites you have buds these are called conidia okay okay this is the columella and these are phyllites okay this is the stalk of the fungus this is typically what we see in aspergillus correct this is what we see in aspergillus so these are called as conidium or conidia these are the inhalational forms of aspergillus so conidia is seen in aspergillus conidia is seen in aspergillus then you come to sporangiospore now sporangiospore looks something like this you have a sporangiophore okay, which is a thin long stalk then you have a big basket covered membrane there was no membrane in conidia where there is a membrane here which are containing a lot of spores inside okay these are called as these inside spores are called as sporangio spores and the covering membrane is called a sporangium this entire ball is called sporangium and this stalk is called a sporangiophore sporangiophore so these sporangiospores are important because they are the ones that are get inhaled in mucor mucor so what is inhaled in mucor is sporangiospore what is inhaled in aspergillus conidia what is inhaled in or what is present in uh, canada conidia only it can be called as blasto uh, conidia or blastospore and one important thing for you to know is that in canada in canada you need the blastospore okay also the bud the true bud to become a pseudo hyphae this has to become a pseudo hyphae for invasion okay so usually in canada albicans what happens is the blastospore becomes pseudo hyphae for invasion otherwise normally endomicrobiome it will remain as blastospore and sit okay but again i'm telling you a clinch pointing here that canada oris and canada glabrata does not require this transformation that that the entire blastospore only can become invasive okay that's why its invasive property is well known so these are the different spores that one has to know apart from this these are all usually sexual stage spores you have another spore which is called as arthroconidia arthroconidia is basically when there is a jointed mycelium like this and individually individually each one behaves as a spore and gets disconnected and then goes into the atmosphere these disconnected or disjoint spores individually are called as arthroconidia and arthroconidia is the most in inhalational form in arthroconidia is the inhalational form in coccidioids coccidioids so coccidioids gets inhaled as arthroconidia goes inside the body remains as a spherule remains as a yeast like spherule otherwise it will remain as mycelium so generally generally this is my understanding is that once the body acquires the inhalant, inhalant particle it usually acquires it as a mycelium once it goes into the body it becomes yeast and then causes a host reaction this is very true almost true for endemic fungi or true for dimorphic fungi okay so once we have gotten gotten uh, used to this kind of a taxonomy of fungi we'll understand what uh, we have summarized so i've already told you about mucocutaneous infections and deep organ mucocutaneous is a lot of morbidity so it causes subcutaneous infection like madura foot etc and then they're rarely fatal whereas deep organ infections cause severe illness and they have a high mortality rate for example canademia 
when you have endemic mycosis usually they're environmentally acquired but they're not part of the human microbiota that's very important for you to know they're not part of the human microbiota okay so they're classified into yeast mold and dimorphic fungi dimorphic is what i've already told you it is 37 in the body and 25 degrees in the soil usually outside in the atmosphere and exclusively yeast forms i've already told you cryptococcus is candida or is candida glabrator exclusively yeast they don't become pseudo hyphae okay now we come to how do fungus actually work why are they causing infections and how are they different from bacterial infections for that you need to understand three different pathophysiological mechanisms okay three first one is when you have a skin or a mucosal breach okay the epithelial defense or epithelial mucosal defense for fungus is the first pathogenesis how does it happen suppose you have something that comes and sits on a breached skin or breached mucosa like canada comes and sits on the mucosa the mucosa itself will be able to sense it okay and release certain antimicrobial peptides that kill the muco kill the canada and then repair the mucosa okay now this is very specific for you to know how does this happen this is present in harrison's so bear with me and understand now il17 is secreted by th17 so these are th17 which are helper cells which secrete il17 when the epithelia or the mucosa is giving signals to these cells so canada comes and sits on the mucosa mucosa will sense it and give signals to the th17 which releases il17 and il17 will again come back to the same mucosa it will have receptors il17 receptors and these receptors will cause a downstream activation of stat jack stat pathway so that stat is activated and stat 3 kills or activate certain uh, antimicrobial peptides that are released into the onto the skin surface which kills the candida this is for mucosal and skin breach only this are epithelial line of defense okay so the epithelial line of defense is as follows first one you are having you have a skin here you have candida over here okay the skin realizes it okay and then secretes some signals which are going to call the th17 it releases il17 il17 acts on the receptor and causes release of the antimicrobial peptides antimicrobial peptides this is the epithelial line of defense are we clear so these are the epithelial if this is if this is uh, clearly understood we can move to the next one the next one is very simple now this is not at the skin level it is gone internal so you go into the blood there is some kind of a uh, um, infection in the lung let us say and the neutrophil has encapsulated the fungus now neutrophil has just realized that the fungus is external or some foreign uh, object and it has encapsulated so this is the neutrophil okay so this is by low there's a fungus that is sitting inside the lysosome of the neutrophil neutrophil is a phagocyte also so it is going to phagocytize and put it into a vesicle and keep it now how it is going to kill it is going to use the nadph burst both oxidative and non-oxidative mechanisms are in play so nadph burst is going to use okay it is going to release reactive oxygen species okay which is going to kill but how is the neutrophil coming inside let us say i have inhaled aspergillus spore this was candida example i gave you this was aspergillus okay so let us say i have inhaled aspergillus and it has gone into the lung so this is the lung so from the blood from the blood you're going to have the neutrophil that is marginating and diapedesis is happening and coming into the lung so this is because of cxcr2 and 4 these are this is a chemokine receptor and chemokine receptor is going to use chemokines released by the neutro, uh, lung and the lung damaged my macrophages it is the neutrophil is going to come from the blood into the lung where it finds the neutrophil phagocytizes it puts it into a phagolysosome uses the nadph burst and kills it one of the important uh, enzyme that was uh, mediating this entire killing is brutin tyrosine kinase remember we used brutin tyrosine kinase like ibrutinib acalabrutinib in cll similarly in lymphomas so that btk or brutin tyrosine kinase is used in this pathway to kill the aspergillus conidium okay so this is the second mechanism another third mechanism this is again in the neutrophil in the blood the third mechanism is actually a very strong mechanism because it involves a macrophage okay releasing il12 when once it has found certain intra macrophagic fungi 
for example yeast like cryptococcus histoplasma like you remember histoplasma is a close dd to tb and tb is macrophage related so histoplasma cryptococcus pneumocystis so all these are engulfed by the macrophage macrophages releases il12 il12 calls the th1 response so th1 releases most important is interferon gamma obviously so interferon gamma comes and interferon gamma is going to cause killing of this particular intramacrophagic fungi this is the th1 macrophage response so you have three different responses one is the epithelial epithelial for candida okay it involves il17 then you have neutrophilic okay which is going to be using the bruton tyrosine kinase pathway and the nadph burst okay which is going to kill aspergillus conidia and then you have macrophage pathway with lymphoid cells noted lymphoid cells which are going to kill intra intra phagocytic fungi for example histoplasma and cryptococcus okay these are three different pathophysiology one two and three this is very very important for you to know please pause go back and read and understand that these three important pathophysiological mechanisms of fungal killing these are the defenses summarizing I'll come to this epithelial, okay, it is going to use something called as a Dectin 1 and Card 9 signaling, which releases interferon and ROS and mucosal immunity is conferred by IL-17. Then you have neutrophils, which are using CXCR4 mediated interaction from the lung to the blood neutrophils, okay, it is going to use the Bruton tyrosine kinase pathway to kill the bacteria. Then you have macrophage and lymphoid cells, which are going to use IL-12 producing by produced by the macrophage to call and stimulate lymphoid cells to produce interferon gamma which is going to kill the fungi okay these are three important pathophysiological mechanisms of this one thing is what, what is important for you to know is a c-type lectin c-type lectin is basically a, a c-type lectin receptor is going to sense the ongoing fungal elements c-type lectin receptor one of the types is called as dectin okay c type lectin receptor one of them is called as dectin so this dectin is going to get stimulated if it senses a fungus so let us say it senses a fungus over here so fungus has been present and dectin senses it it is going to stimulate something called as card 9 this card 9 signaling pathway it's a caspase activated pathway this domain is activated once this card 9 domain is activated it is going to uh, send a series of uh, uh, transcription activators to increase the transcription for reactive oxygen species and interferon so once this interferons and reactive oxygen species are very high it is going to come and kill whatever fungus is supposed to be there so this card 9 signaling is used in import, import is used an important defense for mucosal and epithelial defense again it's an epithelial defense card 9 signaling again is an epithelial defense okay so how do we understand pathophysiology over here what diseases are important over here let us say if i block this interferon what will happen you're going to get a lot of chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis let us say i block il17 what will happen you get again mucocutaneous candidiasis that's why antibodies to il17 for example seen in episode causes CMC or chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. Similarly, if you have card 9 signaling defect, you're going to have congenitally, if you're having problems, you're going to keep continuing having mucocutaneous candidiasis. Okay. Similarly, interferon gamma is inhibited by a uh, drug called as empalumab. Empalumab. Okay. This also causes chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. So all of this corroborate in the same idea. Okay. Second, if you are going to give an inhibition to BTK, what is going to happen? Well, where are BTK inhibitors used? It's used in CLL, mantle lymphoma, etc. You're going to use ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, etc. So when you use these drugs, they're going to cause stoppage in the BTK pathway. The neutrophil can no longer kill it. There is no oxidative burst. Hence, the fungus will persist. So the aspergillus will persist, causing aspergillosis. So invasive cerebral aspergillosis is a hallmark feature of BTK inhibition. BTK inhibition will cause not just any aspergillosis but cerebral aspergillosis. Similarly, if you are going to have no lymphocytes, you are going to have depleted lymphocytes, you are going to have uh, lymphocytic dysfunction, for example, in post-transplantation immun immunosuppression, lymphodepletion, for example, very specifically in HIV. So in these case cases where HIV or CD4 count is very less, in that cases, I am going to get invasive intraphagocytic fungi for example histoplasmosis 
coccidioids, uh, cryptococcus, cryptococcal meningitis, all these, you know, it's very HIV related. They are present in stage 4 HIV, cryptococcal meningitis, etc. So, these are hallmark features of a lymphocytic depletion. So, every chapter on every fungus re being read through in this next few uh, series, you have to put them into one of these three categories. Epithelial defense, neutrophilic defense and macrophagic defense, macrophage and lymphocytic defense. And similarly, on the same lines, you can understand the risk factors for fun fungal infections. If it's an epithelial breach, mucosal breach, okay, you're going to have mucocutaneous candidiasis. If you're going to have problems with regards to neutropenia, for example, in cancer chemotherapy, neutropenia due to um, aplastic anemia, etc., you're going to have aspergillus infections, okay? At the same time, when you're having lymphocyte depletion like in HIV with low CD4 count, you're going to have cryptococcus. So, the risk factors are different. You cannot mix and match everything and anything. It's very important for you to know which BTK inhibitors causes which disease, neutropenia causes which fungal infection, HIV causes which fungal infection, and so on and so forth. At the end, when the immunosuppression is very severe, you can have a mixture and mix and match. But to begin with, you should understand how the pathophysiological mechanisms are. This is the Harrison's diagram, which explains the same thing. You can see epithelial defense here. Okay, you can see Canada has come and sat on the epithelial mucosa. Okay, now you can see that the uh, uh, TH17 cell is activated. It releases what? It releases IL-17 and its subtypes. It acts on the 17 receptor and activates JAK-STAT pathway, which kills the uh, candida. At the same time, IL-22 is not for killing the candida. IL-22 is for epithelial repair, not for killing the candida. So this is for repair after the candida or whatever it's caused. This is the epithelial line of defense. Okay. Then you have neutrophil. Can you see the neutrophil? It has engulfed the aspergillus conidia. These are the conidia. So it is going to use this 5 subunit complex. NADPH is going to use this 5 subunit complex to kill to kill it is going to generate oxygen free radical and going to kill the conidia this involves btk and btk inhibitors are going to cause the aspergillus infections at the same time interferon gamma is also released here you can see you can stop this using empalumab that is also causing aspergillus infections not candida infections so what is the mediating what is calling the neutrophil from the blood to the uh, phagolysosome it is cxcr2 it's a chemokine mediated interaction Okay, so can you, can everybody, can anybody like uh, recollect any particular disorder in which the NADPH burst is uh, uh, problematic, okay, because of an enzyme deficiency. So you have CGD or chronic granulomatous disease. So in chronic granulomatous disease, you have aspergillus infections, not just any aspergillus infection. One aspergillus is extremely specific for aspergillus infections in CGD. That aspergillus is called as aspergillus nidulans. Please note down all of these are present in Harrison somewhere or the other. It can never be present in one format. These are all hint, picked up points that I am telling it to you in one uh, ordered fashion. So in CJD, the aspergillus that is very specific is aspergillus nidulans. Okay. Then you have the third one which is macrophage. You can see the macrophage has engulfed yeast, histoplasma, intra-macrophage, intra-phagocytic fungi. Now this activates, uh, macrophage is going to signal and give IL-12, that is going to stimulate TH1, that is going to secrete interferon gamma and that interferon gamma is going to cause jack start pathway and killing. Okay, so if the lymphocytes are only not present like in HIV, you are going to have lot of cryptocol infections. Okay, so this important diagram summarizes everything. So please note down, pause and recollect and remember it. So I have already told you yeast is one of the biggest classifications but has only few organisms which are candida, cryptococcus and trichosporonosis. Trichosporonosis I told you it mimics hepatosplenic candidiasis. The details or the other columns which are you are seeing you don't have to get confused okay. I will, I will come to it when we are talking about the individual fungi and then again recapsulating this table. If you read this table now you might not understand. Just note down the specific things I am telling. So you look at this, mucosal candidiasis is given separate to invasive candidiasis. Mucosal candidiasis is IL-17 pathway and epithelial defenses. So it is going to you have oropharyngeal and vulvovaginal components. Oropharyngeal, the risk factor is AIDS and glucocorticoids. Vulvovaginal candidiasis, the risk factor is antibiotic use. So what is the risk factor for vulvovaginal candidiasis? Antibiotic use. What is the risk factor for oropharyngeal candidiasis or esophageal candidiasis? AIDS. Now, what is the risk factor for candidemia? Critical illness, ICU. What is the risk factor for disseminated infection in liver, spleen, etc.? Neutropenia, 
okay and glucocorticoids risk factors are different note this valvo vaginal candidiasis the risk factor is antibiotic use antibiotic use and not steroids or not aids so do you remember the question that we learned look at this question i told you a 32 year old lady has come with a curdy discharge no other foci is found you can no, not see any risk factors over here okay so this curdy white discharge is basically a vaginal candida vaginal candida so now for this vaginal candidiasis they're asking which is the most important unique risk factor so the answer to this question is recent antibiotic use so please remember to mark this and not others okay so for vulva vaginal candidiasis the risk factor is antibiotic use and nothing else okay so please remember in contrast to oral thrush hiv is not considered as a major risk factor for vulva vaginal candidiasis instead many women who receive antibiotics may develop vulva vaginal candidiasis so i hope this is clear to everyone now we come to endemic dimorphic fungi this is histoplasmosis histoplasmosis don't please go on telling it as only american you have african variant called histoplasmos histoplasmosis var dubosii okay that's in african it's called as african histoplasmosis histoplasmosis var dubosii then you have blastomyces blastomycosis two types that you have to remember gilchrist uh, gilchristii and dermatitis dermatitis is the one that is associated with an invasive infection although the word it is dermatitis please remember that it is not restricting itself to the skin it is a disseminated infection in contrast to gilchristii which is going to be restricted to lung it's restricting itself to lung okay third one coccidioides mycosis you have two types immitis and posidas okay so here histoplasmosis causes a self-limiting pneumonia this is a very important factor it's like our tb tb causes a primary infection and goes away similarly histoplasmosis causes self-limited pneumonia and goes away so both histoplasmosis and tb cause the lymphadenopathy reaction and upper lobe cavity okay it also causes fibrosing mediastinitis and disseminated infection okay it causes pneumonia and disseminated infection coccidioid mycosis also causes a self-limited uh, uh, pneumonia okay so these risk factors and the uh, further details we will come to in the next session then you come to with filamentous molds okay most important are aspergillus i have already told you what is importance of aspergillus nedulans aspergillus terius is going to be invasive in nature it is a very invasive infection causing asperg uh, aspergillus in the blood aspergillus flavus aspergillus niger then you have mucor mycosis i have told you mucor is sporangiospore sporangiospores these are these are all conidia okay fusariosis fusarium solani is again a very invasive infection Sclerosporiosis again a very invasive infection. It has lot. It can never be cultured in blood, and it has a lot of resistance, but not very much. You can still use posaconazole with combined antifungals, but it is still bad. Then you have uh, pheohyphomycosis, dermato uh, dermatophytosis, eumycetoma. All these are basically um, not 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 opportunistic infections. Okay. Then you have another uh, set of. Uh, endemic infections paracoxidioid mycosis sporotrichosis teleromycosis adiaspiromycosis emergomycosis chromoblastomycosis then other fungi like pneumocystosis so pneumocystis is basically again an opportunistic fungi it's the problem is whether it's a fungus or a bacteria we don't uh, fungus or a parasite we don't know it's kept in fungus so you just have to remember it as a fungus and you have to remember it is pneumocystis gerovesi and not carini because pneumocystis carini is present in rodents and not in humans okay so these are the important tables that you need to know i will come back to these tables in detail once we have finished individual fungi but please note that these are the important points that you need to remember especially with regards to risk factors and please remember which are the ones that are involving btk inhibitors see btk inhibitors are involved in cryptococcosis and like i told you it is also involved in aspergillosis very specifically cerebral aspergillosis and also pneumocystis okay so pneumocystis aspergillosis cerebral and cryptococcus so these are three important infections that are present uh, if you if, if you give btk inhibition okay so now let's come to diagnosis of fungal infections so fungal infections can be diagnosed quite easily because there are few fungi and most likely all the diagnosis will come to uh, view very easily but nevertheless there are certain points that you need to know for diagnosis of definitive diagnosis of fungal infections you need to have the fungus and the fungus invading the set tissue okay because you have a lot of colonizers just having the fungus picked up in the gram stain is not enough 
you need to show some kind of invasion into the tissue or some kind of a reaction. Now, the most important fungus, the best fungal stain is Gomori methamine stain. Okay. So, Gomori methamine stain is a stain that makes the fungus become black. Okay. This makes the fungus appear to become black. Okay. Whereas the second best is PAS, periodic skiff. So, periodic skiff is basically makes the uh, fungus appear pink. Okay. Now, for demonstration of necrosis or angio invasion, an HNE is very much sufficient. So, on an HNE stain, you can see angio invasion and necrosis. In an India ink, which is a negative stain, okay, you are going to see for cryptococcal bodies. So, these are going to be black in color, okay, compared to Alcyon blue, Alcyon blue, which is going to be pink, which is going to make the, it's a positive stain, it is going to be making the um, slide of cryptococcus look pink. Lysis centrifugation is an important question because it increases sensitivity of candida and histoplasma in blood. Okay. It is a method to increase the sensitivity of picking up candida and histoplasma in blood. Malditoff, as you know, is a newer diagnostic modality. It's not new, but it's new to us in our learning. It's a method to demonstrate speciation of fungi. The concept of Malditoff will be discussed in general principles in infection. Serology, antibody to coccidioids, histoplasma antigen, cryptococcal polysaccharide antigen are all demonstrated by serology. And one of the most important role of an MRI, please note, is presence of candida in blood. So, candida in blood can be detected by MRI. Okay, that's a very important finding that you need to understand. Okay, so these are the most important uh, points that you need to know. Apart from this, if you have cultured a particular uh, um, fungus, post that culture you want to identify morphology, the best stain is lactophenol blue. This is present in your supplement. So, please note down that lactophenol blue is one of the uh, stains to stain post culture identification. For culture, you have many different culture medium. You should remember Sabarau dextrose agar. Now, Sabarau dextrose agar is specific because it contains cyclohexamide and a lot of uh, gentamicin or antibacterials which help kill bacteria. Okay. And at the same time, you should know that for dimorphic fungi, okay, one of the most specific medium is brain heart infusion agar. Brain heart infusion agar. BHI can be used in most of the places, but it's very specific for dimorphic fungi. Okay. Please understand that. Okay. Brain heart infusion for dimorphic fungi, Sabarau dextrose agar is at a pH, it's an acidic pH actually. It has a pH of 6.5 and it is used uh, with antibacterials and it's used to uh, culture fungi. Okay. And post culture in said uh, culture media to identify the morphology, we use lactophenol blue. Okay. This is what you have to understand. Then coming to few more important points. I have already told you about the three different pathogenetic mechanisms, correct? So, in those three different pathogenic mechanisms, all of them were immunosuppressed in one or the other means. Either there was lymphopenia or neutropenia or some kind of a macrophage dysfunction or there was an innate immunity defect like mucosal or epithelial breach. These are all different forms of immunosuppression. Now, can there be infections of fungus where the patient is immunocompetent? Yes, there are fungus like cryptosporum, uh, sorry, cryptococcus like cryptococcus gatti, blastomyces infections, which are not that very specific for immunocompromised state. That means they can occur in immunocompetent uh, patients uh, also. Atopy is a risk factor. All of us, we know that atopy is a risk factor for aspergillus. APA, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis is a risk factor, uh, is atopy. But you should also know that pheohyphomycosis is also an important uh, fungal infection which is present in patients with atopy. Okay. So, you should know that blastomyces and cryptococcus gatti can occur in patients with no immunocompromised uh, state also. Okay. This is a very important fact. Come to these fungi which appear like another fungi. For example, on the left hand side you find common like sporotrichosis which is happens during gardening. So, the sporotrichus will 
go along the territory of the lymph, lymph vessel and forms nodules and they ulcerate, correct? So, there, that is called as lympho, lymphocutaneous porotrichosis. The DDs to it which could be lymphocutaneous nocardiosis, leishmaniasis and mycobacterium marinum. These are the DDs to sporotrichosis. They exactly look like sporotrichosis. Then hepatospinic candidiasis, I told you one of the most important yeast is trico, trichosporonosis. Correct? These both candida and trichosporonosis are true yeasts. So they become a DD for each other because they are very invasive in nature, both of them. Pulmonary aspergillosis, the DD is pulmonary mucormycosis. And why is that an important risk factor? Now please note, during COVID, whenever you have treated patients with mucor, you should know that voriconosol should never be given at the induction phase, okay, or at the acute stages. That is because voriconosol is going to suppress aspergillus and mucor is going to continue to grow because mucor, there is no activity of uh, voriconosol on mucor. It is resistant. You have to give amphotericin B for mucor patients. So, it's important to differentiate whether the pulmonary cavity nodules or whatever is due to pulmonary aspergillosis or mucormycosis. That is very important to note. The presence of a pleural effusion, more than 10 nodules on the CT and sinusitis, all these three things will point towards a mucormycosis rather than an aspergillosis. That is very important for one to understand. So that becomes a DD for each other. These three important DDs are important for you to know. So please pause and please remember this important DDs. I will recapitulate them later on also. Now we are coming to certain epidemiological features which I am going to summarize before I go into individual uh, fungi later on. For example, what is the epidemiology of these organisms which are mostly endemic in nature? Histoplasma is seen in North America. They are endemic to North America except Histoplasma von Histoplasma dubosii. This is, this is called as African histoplasmosis. Okay. So it's not just North America, but it is endemic to North America. Okay. It is seen in humid and acidic acidic soil. Okay. It is associated with a lot of disturbed soil. For example, a rebuilding of a home. Okay. Breakdown of uh, homes or disaster striking or high exposure activities like spelunking, excavation and cleaning of chicken coops and demolition. These kind of disturbed environment is going to release the spores of histoplasma that is going to be inhaled. Similarly, in coccidioids, it is seen in the western hemisphere between 20 north and 40 north and 40 south. Okay, and that is very important. It is seen not in the deepest soils, that, that they are seen in the more superficial layers of the soil. They also require some amount of acidity, but they are seen post rainy season not during post rainy season where some amount of humidity is still left. Okay. It is not found in greater depths. That is very important for you to know. It is not found in greater depths. It is found in moderate tem temperate ranges. Okay. Third is cryptococcosis. Again, it is inhalational. You should know that cryptococcosis has two important species, cryptococcus neoformans and cryptococcus gatti. Cryptococcus neoformans is basically acquired through exposure to pigeon excreta or avian excreta. But that's not the case for Cryptococcus gatti. Cryptococcus gatti uh, spreads it through tree leaves. It's on eucalyptus tree leaves. Okay, that's very important. Okay, the spores are on the tree leaves of eucalyptus or other trees in the arid region. Okay, and Cryptococcus gatti, again I'm recapitulating, can happen in patients who are completely normal also. Fourth one is Blastomyces. Blastomyces is seen in some areas called as microfoci. So what are microfoci? So microfoci are those regions of a soil or land wherein there is some amount of uh, humidity or some amount of water or moisture because of nearby water sources. At the same time, they are having some acidification. This acidification is due to breakdown of dead matter. So there must be decaying matter also like dead carcasses. It could be plant or uh, animal uh, 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 meat or something like that or washed up uh, uh, excreta. So these decaying matter will lead to acidification of soil and these soil near the water source is called as a microfoci. So these microfoci you are going to find or it's going to be a hotspot for blastomyces. And blastomyces are two species, blastomyces gilchristii and blastomyces dermatitis, of which blastomyces dermatitis is going to be invasive in nature. Okay. Now, at the same time, you should know what is the genetic basis of 
thermal dimorphism. So thermal dimorphism or dimorphism is basically when you can switch between 25 degrees Celsius to 37 degrees Celsius between uh, mycelia and yeast. That is because of the histidine kinase that is present in blastomyces. So this histidine kinase is, is uh, basically given a name called DRK. So DRK stands for the dimorphism regulating kinase. Okay, it's a dimorphism regulating kinase. It requires cysteine, okay, for it, is, it for it to switch between the two forms. And bad one is one of the most important virulence factor for blastomyces. So remember that bad one, DRK, or which is a histidine kinase, and cysteine are required for the virulence and thermal dimorphism of blastomyces. I'm going to recapitulate all of this in the further sessions. Now, these are few etiopathogenetic factors. I have already talk, taught you what are different spores. I have talked about arthroconidia, conidium, I have talked about blastospores, sporangiospores and all of that. So, now we are going to see which are which. I have told you that most of them are conidia. So, histoplasma, coccidia, uh, histoplasma, uh, blasto, uh, blastomyces, aspergillus are all conidial forms. These are all microconidia in histoplasma. Blastomyces is conidia, aspergillus is conidia. But please note the sporangiospore of mucor. Mucor gets inhaled in the form of sporangiospores. Okay. Whereas arthroconidium, I told you the disjointed, the jointed ones become disjointed. Those are called as arthrospores. I've seen in coccidioids. Okay. These are all inhaled or inoculated. Okay. Histoplasma needs calcium and iron inside the phagocytes for formation of yeast. Yeast has to be formed within the body. They are going to be inhaled as conidia and become seized inside the body. This requires a lot of calcium and iron. So it's also some kind of a siderophore in this respect. Okay. So histoplasma requires calcium and yeast. Coccidioids in the environment. Okay. It's an arthroconidium gets inhaled. It forms a lot of spores and becomes a big spherule. So this spherule is present inside the uh, host. Okay, it's very important for you to know. So, which is in the environment and which is in the body that has to be delineated. Blastomyces basically happens in patients who are having polymorphism in IL-6. IL-6 polymorphism is the first time that you're reading in mycology is only in blastomyces. Okay, and blastomyces is one of the um, most important organisms, fungal organisms that can cause ARDS. Everywhere else, histoplasma or uh, pneumocystis is all pneumonia or basically cysts. ARDS is an immune response because of blastoconidia and the immune response is because of IL-6 and such polymorphisms in IL-6 are uh, patients who are going to susceptible for um, blastomyces infections. So IL-6, inflammation, ARDS, all of them are a boost of immune response. So basically that is because that is because of which a, uh, blastomyces will cause ARDS. Then you have paracoxidioids. Paracoxidioids is seen mostly in Brazil. It has a very striking male to female ratio of 14 is to 1. So males have a preponderance here and that is because again of conidia inhalation because of disturbed soil like histoplasma. Then coming to Canada. Canada I have told you is a yeast and a pseudohyphae. Okay. So here the I have already told you before that the blastospore, this is the blastospore. Okay. Has to become pseudohyphae. The pseudohyphae has to be formed or a hyphal element has to come. Only then it can invade. Otherwise, if it is just blastospore, nothing much, need, nothing happens usually with Canada albicans. So, blastospore, blastospore to pseudohyphal stage is very important for the uh, pathogenesis of uh, infection in Canada. Except in Oris and Glabrata, where this conversion is not required, it will cause invasion by itself without the conversion. Okay. Then we have Aspergillus. Aspergillus, I have already told you, the most important risk factor for Aspergillus are neutrophil related. That means patients with neutropenia, cancer chemotherapy are going to have aspergillus infections. Apart from that, you will have COPD, ECMO, ibrutinib. I told you in the middle pathogenesis. Do you remember? Can we just go back? In the middle pathogenesis, I've already told you. This is the middle pathogenesis. So it's neutrophil, correct? So neutrophil is going to come with chemokines uh, signaling and enter the um, uh, neutrophil will going to engulf the uh, arthroconidia uh, of the aspergillus and the 5 subunit NADPH burst mechanism will kill it. This involves BTK, correct? This involves BTK. This BTK inhibition by ibrutinib or acalabrutinib is going to cause aspergillus infection. But what did I tell you? That steroids have no action in the middle pathway. That means no matter how much steroids I give, IDO steroids are not an important risk factor in this condition. Whereas steroids is going to cause some kind of a lymphopenia here. 
okay so this steroids is going to immunosuppression will happen mostly in the th1 and macrophage pathway but not so much in the neutrophil pathway so therefore high dose steroids are not an important risk factor when you consider aspergillus high dose steroids are not an important factor when you consider aspergillus correct now come to mucor mucor i have already told you it's not a conidia it's a sporangio spores that are being inhaled and the most important risk factor we've heard about it is dka correct whenever you had a patient with dk you're going to have mucor that was a understanding that we all had but why is that so when you're having dka the acidotic component is basically due to butyrate correct hydroxy keto hydroxy butyrate so this butyric acid is going to cause upregulation of the iron sequestering proteins and also it is going to upregulate two important proteins those two important proteins are called as cot h okay cot h and grp 78 so this cot h and grp 78 is going to be upregulated these are basically invasive proteins they are going to invade through tissues and they, they clog the blood vessels that's where the angio invasive property of mucor comes from this hyperglycation of these proteins and sidrophoric activity is going to make mucor what mucor is okay so mucor is uh, the prop the pathogenicity of mucor is because of hyperglycation and butyric acid upregulation of cot and grp 78 okay so this is the few important ethiopathogenetic features of individual fungi but nonetheless you have to understand the main three important pathogenetic mechanisms which spores are in which uh, fungi and what are the most important clinching features in each fungi okay now let's take a detour okay we have understood the common principles everywhere let's learn about some few fungi that have a very classical features i have told you that in the middle pathogenetic pathway regarding neutrophils neutrophils will require nadph oxidase for the burst when that is absent congenitally it is called as chronic granulomatous disease and i've also told you one of the most important aspergillus that is required in that case um, i'm sorry one of the most important aspergillus that is implicated in that uh, disease is aspergillus nidulans so aspergillus nidulans is one of the most important or unique aspergillus that is present in cgd okay second i told you aspergillus terrius is very invasive and very poor it, it portends a poor prognosis aspergillus terrius okay aspergillus flavus will cause local infections like sinusitis keratitis and cutaneous infections flavus is not as bad as terrius aspergillus niger is resistant to isuva conosol and itraconosol isuva and itra are basically the last line uh, azoles they are resistant to them also okay so it's a bad drug with respect to resistance aspergillus is, aspergillus niger is resistant but terrius is not resistant terrius is just invasive but it still responds to the drugs I have already told you that blastosis dermatitis, blastomyces dermatitis is more invasive. Don't go with the word dermatitis, but it is very invasive. Whereas Gilchristia is only lim limiting itself to the lung. And blastomyces, one of the most important property is IL-6 polymorphism. Okay. Patients with IL-6 polymorphisms are more prone to have blastomyces. And what do they cause? They cause ARDS. Very specific. Okay. They also cause pneumonia, but they cause ARDS also. Very specific. Then we come to Oris and Glabrata. We have learned time and again that it is resistant to everything and it is bad prognosis. But what? Why is it so? There is a gene which is ERG11 and mute, which which causes mutations in the lanosterol demethylase. So lanosterol becomes ergosterol because of 14 demethylase. That is called as lanosterol demethylase. Now lanosterol demethylase mutations will happen in these Canada Oris and Glabrata. That's why those azoles won't work okay that's why these are resistant so it is erg11 encoded mutations in the lanosterol demethylase also efflux pumps efflux pumps also there lomentospora why should you know lomentospora lomentospora is an emerging resistant fungi please open and listen to me Schedosporium and lomentospora are important resistant fungi lomentosporum is usually culturable from the blood but they are never uh, easily treatable from in a, um, with antifungals. Can you see over here? Schedosporiosis. Schedosporiosis, on the other hand, is also an emerging resistant fungi, but it is not cultured from the blood. Okay, but it can be give a treatment can be given for schedosporiosis with some kind of a combination of posaconazole and amphotericin. Candens also can be given, but lomentospora we don't have a drug currently in market or as per, as per Harrison's it's currently resistant to all known antifungals so please remember lomentospora as an emerging resistant fungi 
another small trivia about canada what causes dent denture sore mouth denture sore mouth is caused by canada don't put any other virus herpes nothing it's canada denture sore mouth is caused by canada coming to the principles of management of fungal infections so principles of management you should know whether to remove the source that has an important thing or initiating therapy which is more important both are important correct which is more important please remember that initiating therapy is more important than source removal source removal can, has to be done there is no doubt it has to be done okay but initiating therapy has a higher role than source removal okay please understand that one point then coming to different uh, classes of antifungals the first one is a fungicidal so fungicidal is just going to kill it completely that one is amphotericin b amphotericin b is going to create holes in the fungal chitin and the membrane so that all the uh, contents leak out and the fungus dies okay the fung amphotericin is one of the main state drugs for induction of i mean in the in the management of acute uh, stages of mucormycosis okay after the patient improves you can probably step down to isoconazole and posaconazole but at the acute stages mucor means it's as amphotericin amphotericin is also used for fusariosis fusariosis is a very bad fungal infection okay it's very invasive also okay endemic mycosis all the endemic mycosis you should remember amphotericin has given there is no doubt amphotericin is definitely given for endemic mycosis and it is definitely given for induction of cryptococcal meningitis induction of cryptococcal meningitis okay while maintenance maintenance we're going to give fluconazole amphotericin b will cause some kind of an rta that's for you should cause potassium and magnesium to be low these patients will come with infusion chills you should always remember to give it a lot of fluids monitor potassium and magnesium frequently okay so this is about amphotericin amphotericin comes both in conventional form or in the forms of liposomal forms or deoxycholate forms liposomal forms are less, less ne nephrotoxic and is the preferred choice that is present in the current scenario but since it's expensive we we usually use the conventional form okay amphotericin b amphotericin b is usually given until clinical improvement especially in the resistant cases we have to give it until clinical improvement only once clinical improvement is done then we are going to step down to something else and usually a, con, a, a cumulative doses of amphotericin is what we target we don't target a particular uh, um, end point other than more than a cumulative dose by that cumulative dose they should respond more than that we can't give amphotericin next coming to azoles all the azoles basically inhibit i told you one enzyme called as lanosterol demethylase so 14 demethylase is inhibited by azoles hence it is called fungi static fungi static first one of it is fluconazole this is one of the most important azoles and all these azoles mind you all these the chemistry is these are triazoles okay these are all triazoles why because there are other ketoconazole clotrimoxazole which are mostly cutaneous they never given for serious infections on the other hand, fluconazole is used for an important uh, three conditions, which you can remember by the mnemonic CM. Okay, it is used for mucosal candidiasis, uh, coccidial, coccidial meningitis, and maintenance uh, period of uh, cryptococcus meningitis. Okay, so candidiasis, which is mucosal meningitis, coccidial, and meningitis of uh, cryptococcus in the maintenance phase, because induction phase you use amphotericin. Now, fluconazole has penetrates everywhere. It penetrates CSF, it penetrates urine. And mind you, because it penetrates urine, it is one of the most important drugs with amphotericin B for renal abscess or candida uh, abscess in the kidney or candida in the urine. Whereas you cannot use echinocandins for the treatment of urine because echinocandins will not reach the urine in adequate amounts. It also causes alopecia and liver toxicity. At the same time, remember that some amount of uh, link is there between fluorosis and an antler Bixley syndrome. Anter, antler Bixley phenotype is basically a cranio, craniosculatal dysplasia that is present in uh, some certain patients. Okay, it is linked with that. Okay, next we come to itraconazole. So in itraconazole, um, please remember CM for fluconazole. Itraconazole. It is broader. The spectrum is broader. It is used for chronic coccidioid mycosis, pheohyphomycosis, porotrichosis, mucocutaneous mycosis such as oropharyngeal candida, oropharyngeal candida, versicolor, tinea capitis and onychomycosis. Okay. So dermatophytic, esophageal candidiasis, meaning the mucosal which is deeper. Okay. Basically organ. 
okay it is also available as a suspension that's very very important as available suspension and itraconazole voriconazole all of them are in interacting with cyp450 cyp3a4 is one of the most important thing that it interacts with okay so it's very important for you to know the drug interactions all of these interact with cyp450 it has a, a vehicle carrier called the cyclodextrin this cyclodextrin is going to cause nephrotoxicity okay so cyclodextrin is present in itraconazole which causes nephrotoxicity at the same time, it has some amount of cardiac toxicity and hepatotoxicity. So much so that it is associated with heart failure. So, itraconazole, heart failure. In heart failure patients, we cannot give itraconazole. Now, we come to voriconazole. So, I am stepping up. Voriconazole is even broader than itraconazole. So, it is effective against Canada glabrata. That's very important. It is effect against, effective against Canada glabrata, Canada cruci, aspergillus, sclerosporium, and endemic diamorphic fungi but not mucor but not mucor okay it is the preferred agent for the treatment of aspergillosis uh, and also has been uh, used for treatment uh, treatment of sclerosporiosis sclerosporiosis you can use voriconazole it can also be used as a step down therapy for patients with coccidioid mycosis blastomycosis or histoplasmosis but only step down because the most important thing for endemic mycosis you are going to give amphotericin be in the starting phases now coming to posaconazole, everything of voriconazole was included, but it was also active against mucor. So posaconazole is basically voriconazole plus mucor. You can understand it that way. Okay. Now posaconazole specific point, it's used in a profile axis. It is used in a profile axis of febrile neutropenia and transplant, bone marrow transplant. Okay. Post bone marrow transplant, you can give this patient posaconazole also. So posaconazole P for P, posaconazole for profile axis. Okay, please remember it this way. So, CM for fluconazole and PP for posaconazole and prophylaxis. Posaconazole does not have this liver, skin or visual toxicity like how voriconazole had. Voriconazole patients complain of photosensitivity. So much so that this liver, photosensitivity, visual disturbance, everything mimics like an SLE like a pattern. So, the side effect of voriconazole will mimic SLE. Okay, it will mimic like the patient is getting an SLE like a flare. Okay. Because it has cutaneous reactions also. That's why it mimics a SLE like features. Liver, photosensitivity, visual disturbances and skin also. Okay. At the same time, one important side effect of voriconazole is a periosteitis. It is asso fluorosis associated periosteitis is seen with voriconazole. Okay. These are the important drugs. Coming to echinocandins. Echinocandins can be looking like, you know, caspofungin, mica fungin, anidula fungin. All these three fungins are basically like a very strong duck, but they are very limited in their spectrum. That is, they only use for Canada and mostly less for aspergillus. But they are definitely used for Canada. And even that Canada, it cannot be used in the urine because it never reaches adequate levels in the urine. Echinocandins inhibit an enzyme called as beta 1,3 glucan synthase. Okay, beta synthase. This is basically required for the formation of the ergosterol cell membrane. But, uh, but when you inhibit this, the fungus is now prone for easy uh, damage, so it will die. That's the mechanism of action. Flu cytosine. Flu cytosine is, is basically a precursor of 5 fluorouracil It is used with amphotericin B in the treatment of C CSF infections, especially cryptococcal meningitis, because it clears the fungus rapidly from the CSF, but it is hepatotoxic. Hepatotoxicity is also present in griseofulvin and terbinafine, both of which are dermatophytic agents. So, terbinafine and griseofulvin are basically, uh, terbinafine inhibits squalene epoxidase, squalene epoxidase, okay. Whereas, griseofulvin is a microtubule disassembly. It inhibits, uh, it go, it's going to destroy the microtubules. So, both griseofulvin and terbinafine are used for dermatophytic infections. It is also hepatotoxic and it limits itself to the skin. It can be used for um, onychomycosis. Why? Because onychomycosis, you need to give itraconazole. Please remember on, on, itraconazole onychomycosis. Okay. In vaginal candidiasis, remember that intravaginal application of uh, fluconazole needs to be repeated. Okay. You need to keep repeating it. But if you give once oral fluconazole, it is enough. So, in vaginal candidiasis, oral fluconazole given once has the advantage of not requiring multiple doses of intravaginal application. Okay, so let's take a review question. Um, elderly man with uh, treatment who is undergoing a treatment for CLL, okay, with ibrutinib, okay, is not likely to develop which of the following. Now, I have already told you ibrutinib is ibrutin tyrosine kinase inhibitor, BTK inhibitor. 
BTK was required in which pathway? It was required in the second pathway, which is the neutrophil pathway. Okay. So because of which neutrophil pathway is mostly because of uh, you'll get infections with aspergillus, correct? So I told you cerebral aspergillus. Cerebral aspergillosis is definitely going to come if you're going to use Ibrutinib for a long time. This is correct. Then obviously you're going to have pneumocystis and cryptococcus. Both are present in the table that we have learnt. Okay. So the answer is candidiasis. The answer is candidiasis. Candidiasis has nothing to do with um, um, basically Ibrutinib. It can happen in severe stages, but the best of the four options is candidiasis. If you go back, You go back and see i have already told you btk inhibition okay aspergillus then i have also told you one more ptk inhibition pneumocystosis correct again we have told you btk inhibition cryptococcus but candida we have not seen btk inhibition so candidiasis is not the one that is going to be expected here so of the four candida is the best option okay Next question, which of the following is not true about fungal sensitization? What is fungal sensitization? So at the end of this lecture, I want to talk about what is fungal sensitization and close the entire lecture. Fungal sensitization is basically creating a background of allergy or allergy for the fungus to come and attack. We have learned that atopy is a risk factor for aspergillus and pheohyphomycosis. Similarly, there are other fungi like Alternaria and Cladosporium, which are going to cause some kind of allergy to the patient, but not frank ABPA. Okay. If ABPA is happening, the IgA levels will be increased a lot. It will go uh, more than 1000 th uh, and then it's going to cause the picture of a frank um, uh, uh, lung infection, uh, lung uh, issue. But in fungal sensitization, what happens is it is not as severe. There is a lot of bronchial wall thickening because of a reaction in local areas. But it is not severe enough to fit the criteria for ABP. And IgE levels are usually less than 1000. Okay. So IgE levels less than 1000. And there is some amount of bronchitis in the patient. Okay. So some kind of bronchial wall thickening is definitely there. And it is not meeting the criteria for ARPA. But still some kind of fungal sensitization is present. This is called as fungal sensitization. Okay. So fungal sensitization with the Fungal sensitization with uh, uh, ABPA is together called fungal asthma. Together is called as fungal asthma. Okay. Now, fungal asthma is an important feature of aspergillus, but can also be present in alternaria and cladosporium. Okay. So, if you can see. Which of the following is not true about fungal sensitization? It can be due to non aspergillus fungi such as alternaria and cladosporium. It is true. Uh, serum total Ig concentration of more than 1000. No, it is false. It is less than 1000. Bronchial wall thickening is common. It is true. Some patients are not ABPA but are still allergic to fungi. It is true. They are not ABPA. They are not fitting into ABPA. So this is the correct answer. So the serum Ig levels will be less than 1000 in patients with fungal sensitization. Okay. So fungal sensitization plus SAFS. Okay. Fungal sensitization together is called as fungal asthma. Okay. Together is called as fungal asthma. So thank you. Um, we'll see uh, about individual fungi in the next sessions.